Hi guys, it's Quinn here. If you enjoy my videos, consider hitting the like button. It's the only way the YouTube algorithm really notices me. In this video, we will discuss the early events of the Galaxy Era in the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy by Xi Shen Lu. This video will contain major spoilers for the series, so just keep that in mind. After the destruction of Earth's solar system by way of the listener's dimension strike, Shang Jin and AA were the only humans left in the universe other than the inhabitants of the vessels Blue Space and Gravity, and Tian Ming, whose brain had been captured by the Trisolarans. The Trisolarans had been mankind's first cosmic foe. They had used Tian Ming's brain to plan an attack against humanity, which annihilated mankind's entire space force. Humankind only succeeds in thwarting them when they reveal the location of both Trisolaris and the Earth to the greater universe. Because of the dark forest state of the cosmos, the Trisolaris star system was destroyed, and Earth's some time later. After escaping the dimension strike which had destroyed the sun and the Earth, Shang Xin heads to the one place where she hopes to find human life, Tianming's star, DX3906. Long before Shang Xin had ever entered cryosleep, Tianming gifted her with this star. Tianming had gifted it anonymously. At first Shang Xin had no idea who could have done it. She assumed it had to have been some wealthy secret admirer. Though at the time of the gifting the star had no practical value to Shang Xin and was merely a gesture, she appreciated it. DX3906 was in this universe, and it might even outlast the Earth and the Sun. She would see it one day. She stood on the balcony of her apartment at night, gazing up at the sky and imagining her star. The lights of the city below cast a dim yellow glow against the cloud cover, but she imagined her star giving the clouds a rosy glow. In her dream, she flew over the star's surface. It was a rose-colored sphere, but instead of scorching flames, she felt the coolness of a spring breeze. Below her was the clear water of an ocean, through which she could still see swaying, rose-colored clouds of algae. After she woke up, she laughed at herself. As an aerospace professional, even in her dreams, she could not forget that DX3906 had no planets. The star of our destination project, which had facilitated Tian Ming's purchase of DX3906, had also granted ownership of 17 other stars to individuals. It is mentioned that the Great Ravine, which during the early Crisis Era annihilated 5 billion humans, acted as a giant sieve. Because of the great loss of life, 14 of the star's owners were lost to history. No record of what became of them existed, and no legal heirs could be found. This, in fact, was the reason for Shang Xin's awakening from her hibernation 264 years after she was initially put into cryogenic sleep. It was initially believed that the star, DX3906, had no planets, but that turned out to not be true, and as Earth's technological progression continues, its value shifted beyond the symbolic into the practical. By the age of the sword holder, aka the deterrence era, the idea of reaching a star within 300 light years of the Earth was no longer a fantasy. A PhD in astronomy named AA discovered the planets around DX3906. As part of her dissertation, AA had developed a new technique that used one star as a gravitational lens through which to observe another. It was eventually discovered that one of the planets rotating DX3906 was Earth-like, and the UN and the solar system fleet wanted to reclaim the star system. Legally, this could not be done unless Shang Xin, the owner, agreed to transfer the title. Shang Xin valued the star sentimentally, so she made a deal. After much reflection, she came up with a new proposal. She would sell the two planets, but retain ownership of the star. At the same time, she would sign a covenant with the UN and the fleet, granting humanity the right to use the energy produced by the star. The legal experts eventually concluded that this proposal was acceptable. After the destruction of the solar system, Shang Xin and AA would speed towards the star in humanity's first ever light speed ship, named Halo. Halo's curvature propulsion engine provided the fastest speed humanity had yet been capable of. 
The ship's artificial intelligence was able to locate the star, which has by this point in history been renumbered S7439-E2. The star was approximately 287 light years away. The ship informed them that it would take 52 hours from Halo's frame of reference. This was of course the effect of relativistic time. Eventually they arrived at the star. It was about the size of Earth's sun, but it produced a redder light. From the reference point of Earth, it had been nearly 300 years since the dimension strike which collapsed the solar system into two dimensions. So 286 years have already passed back there? Ege asked. She looked as if she had just awakened from a dream. Guess, if you're using their frame of reference. Shengzin sighed. For the solar system in its current condition, was there a difference between 286 years and 2.86 million years? The two planets orbiting the star were not similar. The one furthest away from the star was desolate and gray. The close planet, which was about the size of Earth but had no moon, was blue, and the ship's AI determined that it had an oxygen-rich atmosphere and many signs of life. They decided that they would call the world Planet Blue. On the world, Shang Xin and AA encounter a man named Guan Yi Fan. He had been one of the inhabitants of the ship Blue Space, which left Earth's solar system earlier during the Crisis Era. He had been hibernating for 400 years. He came to the world on an exploratory mission with others who left before Shang Xin and AA arrived. Blue Space and its sister ship Gravity at this point were the subject of ancient history. My name is Guan Yi Fan. I've been waiting for you here. How did you know we would come? AA asked, allowing Yi Fan to hold her hand. We received your gravitational wave transmission. You are from Blue Space. The inhabitants of the ships had gone on to invent curvature propulsion as well, and inhabit four reclusive worlds throughout the universe. Yifan explains that Planet Blue would be a prime candidate for colonization, but no one resided on the world. This was due to the planet's proximity to the Orion Arm. Extraterrestrials often visited this system due to the fact that two busy shipping lanes flowed through this region of space. They also learned from Yifan that Earth's solar system met a worse fate than they had previously thought. Luo Ji, the first sword holder of humankind, had believed that humankind's legacy would be preserved, flattened in two dimensions. That is why they carved in stone on the planet Pluto. But in reality, it was all lost. All that remained in the region of space that had once been our solar system was darkness. Even if you go back there now, you wouldn't be able to see anything. That part of space is empty. The two-dimensional sun and planets you saw were actually just the result of the release of energy when three-dimensional material collapsed into two dimensions. What you saw wasn't two-dimensional material, only the refraction of electromagnetic radiation at the interface between two-dimensional and three-dimensional space. After the energy was released, nothing would be visible. The two-dimensional solar space has no contact with three-dimensional space. It was in fact impossible to see two-dimensional space from three dimensions. This was due to the fact that 3D space has thickness while 2D space has none. Therefore light from the third dimension passes through two-dimensional space unhindered. The second dimensional world was fully transparent. The only thing that could be detected was gravity. The gravity of the solar system still has an effect. So in that empty space ought to be detectable as an invisible source of gravity. Shang Xin and AA looked at each other thoughtfully. Sounds like dark matter, doesn't it? Yi Fan laughed. Shang Xin and AA then learned from Yi Fan what became of the Trisolarans, who at once sought to annihilate mankind and claim the Earth for their own. The life forms, which had developed unique ways of survival due to the harsh conditions of their homeworld, were forced to face the harsh reality of existence in the dark forest just as humans were. No data was ever found on what happened to the initial Trisolaran fleet, just that the second fleet with its superior propulsion systems never met up with it. The second Trisolaran fleet left a trace of itself 60 years prior to Shang Xin landing on Planet Blue. Humanity had observed that a large-scale space battle had taken place near the Tars constellation. The Trisolarans had come into contact with an unknown and powerful alien force. It was brutal and the resulting wreckage formed a new interstellar dust cloud. We know that one of the sides in the battle was the second Trisolaran fleet, but we don't know who they were fighting against. We also don't know 
how the battle ended. It remained to be seen whether or not humanity would ever one day again encounter the Trisolarans. The invention of light speed space travel had been an incredible milestone for mankind. Its presence fundamentally changed human culture and civilization. It was now possible within a human lifetime to reach the end of the universe. In fact, some were already trying. By accelerating their curvature propulsion engines to maximum, they could approach the speed of light continuously. Relativistically, not much time would pass for those on board these ultimate spaceships as they are called, compared to the outside universe. Some call them doomsday ships. These light speed ships have no destination at all. They turn their curvature engines to maximum and accelerate like crazy, infinitely approaching the speed of light. Their goal is to leap across time using relativity until they reach the heat death of the universe. By their calculations, 10 years within their time frame of reference would equal 50 billion years in hours. Shangxin is now filled with wonder at all that humanity has accomplished and expresses pity for those that never got to leave Earth's original solar system. But Yithan tells her not to pity them, for the reality of the universe is nothing to envy. Here, more than 600 years after Luo Ji had first realized that our universe was a dark forest, another terrible fact about cosmic reality was unveiled. Darkness. Only darkness. You mean the dark forest state? Guan Yifan shook his head, a gesture that appeared to be a struggle in hypergravity. For us, the dark forest state is all important but it's just a detail of the cosmos. If you think of the cosmos as a great battlefield, dark forest strikes are nothing more than snipers shooting at the careless messengers, messmen, etc. In the grand scheme of the battle, they are nothing. You have not seen what true interstellar war is like. Have you? We've caught a few glimpses, but most things we know are just guesses. Do you really want to know? Yifan asked Shangxin to consider the most powerful weapon a civilization possessing almost infinite technological prowess could create. She remembered the cruelty of the dimension strike, and that gave her her answer. The universal laws of physics. That's right. The universal laws of physics are the most terrifying weapons, and also the most effective defenses. Whether it's by the Milky Way or the Andromeda Galaxy, at the scale of the local galactic group or the Virgo supercluster, those warring civilizations possessing godlike technology will not hesitate to use the universal laws of physics as weapons. There are many laws that can be manipulated into weapons, but most commonly, the focus is on spatial dimensions and the speed of light. Typically, lowering spatial dimensions is a technique for attack, and lowering the speed of light is a technique for defense. It is revealed to Shang Xin in this moment that not only will the dimension strike on Earth's solar system never end, Earth was far from the only solar system that was currently collapsing, and the collapse would spread until all of the universe was two dimensional. Shang Xin protested, stating that this would make no sense. Why would it make sense to use dimensional strikes as weapons if, in the long run, the attackers would be killed as well? But she was not considering that there was, in fact, a way for the attacker to avoid death. These godlike races, with the power to collapse dimensions and manipulate light, could alter themselves as well. Alter themselves into creatures who could survive in lower dimensions. The universe had, in fact, been collapsing since the 10th dimension, and every time, the attacking warring races would convert into a lower dimension before beginning it all over again. Shang Xin is also told of death lines. Death lines were tales produced by one of the most advanced but rarely seen light speed technologies. It was rarely used because of the danger involved with these death lines. You see, light speed within a death line was absolutely zero. Inside it, every fundamental particle, every quark is dead. There is no vibration. Even without a source of gravity inside, each death line is a black hole a zero gravity black hole. Anything that falls in cannot re-emerge. 
Only one group in the universe was known to regularly use this technology. They were called the Zero Homers. Their mission was to trigger the reset of the universe and return it to the glory of ten dimensions. Deathlines are usually the product of the Zero Homers. Zero Homers? They're also called Resetters. Maybe they're a group of intelligent individuals, or a civilization, or a group of civilizations. We don't know exactly who they are, but we've confirmed their existence. The Zero Homers want to reset the universe and return it to the Garden of Eden. How? By moving the hour hand of the clock past 12. Take spatial dimensions as an example. It's practically impossible to drag a universe in lower dimensions back into higher dimensions. So maybe it's better to work forward in the other direction. If the universe can be lowered into zero dimensions, and then beyond, the clock might be reset and everything returned to the beginning. The universe might possess ten macroscopic dimensions again. Shengzin would eventually travel to the end of the universe, as the remnants of humanity and countless other races are called to restore the broken pieces of space-time and return the universe to its prior glory. We will discuss these events which take place at the end of Death's End and in the spin-off novel Redemption of Time in a future video. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe for more Quinn's Ideas. So we've got some great news, guys. Quinn's Ideas officially has a Discord. Now my goal is to make this Discord a great place for all science fiction fans to come and talk about science fiction, share their favorite books, share their love of science fiction stories and concepts while having a lot of fun. I'm really excited about this new way to engage with my community and to create more connectivity between my viewers. I hope you will join us over on Discord Thank you so much. Just a heads up for those of you that may be interested, my next graphic novel, The Lie Behind the Star, is launching February 2023. You can sign up now to get on the email mailing list to get notified as soon as it launches. More information on my website, link in the description. Thank you guys so much.